Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Be someone who cultivates a love for God's Word. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord.
up in the splendor. The title of the message this morning is Life in the Spirit. If you're making notes, you might want to jot that down. Life in the Spirit. And this is part one, and we hope you'll join us again next Sunday for part two. So this is a message that deals with living by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't you think that that sounds like such a good thing, that we would be living by the power of the Holy Spirit? And it is based on the first part of Romans chapter 8. Do you know that the entire eighth chapter of the book of Romans deals with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Some people don't know this, but there's a lot to learn about the Spirit of God. And so if you want to discover more about the Holy Spirit, I would submit to you that you simply cannot ignore Romans chapter 8. And it's interesting to note that the word spirit occurs no less than 20 times in chapter 8. Very interesting. Now, some of the concepts in Romans 8 are perhaps a little difficult to understand. And that's why many people maybe don't read Romans as often as we should. There's some things that are a bit difficult to understand. They are definitely not elementary. But if you are passionate about Jesus, then you're not going to just settle for where you're at, the status quo. You're going to move forward in the things of God. And so we got to press deeper as the people of God. Amen? we got to press deeper. Now, I'm also speaking about life in the Spirit this morning because we've just passed through Pentecost, and the significance there is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in terms of that, I felt, sensing my heart, the need to continue in this same vein and discover more about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But let's get into our reading for this day. And it's Romans chapter 8, just the first five verses, verse 1 to 5. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The last verse, verse five. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And we say the Lord bless the reading of his holy word, amen. Point number one, here we go. Quite simply, no condemnation. Would you please say that with me, even at home? No condemnation. So, what is the definition of condemnation? Maybe it's good to just refresh our minds so that we're all in the same wavelength. The definition of uh, condemnation is pronouncement of guilt, punishment for wrongdoing. Condemnation is also, it's disapproval, it's blame. For instance, uh, maybe you've heard the terminology of a building that's uh, had an earthquake or a severe fire, and then the building is condemned. It's declared unfit for use. That basically means that the building is declared no good. And you see, the enemy would like to try, declare you no good, and get you in your mind to battle in such a way that you get declared no good. But God is speaking to you today. Romans 8 verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want to say to you folks, right off the bat, this is good news. 
If you read this verse and somehow there's not a little spark of joy in you, then I don't know, something's wrong. But this is good news that there's no condemnation. The same verse, verse one in the Amplified says, there is therefore now no condemnation. And then it says in brackets, no guilty verdict, no punishment to those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's so important that we are in Christ, meaning that we've received him as our Lord and our Savior, and he's become our all in all. But also, verse one in the message version uh, has this little phrase which helped me to understand this a little bit more. It says this, we no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. That makes it a bit more understandable for me. For instance, imagine that you are always living under a dark, heavy cloud. Imagine that's your life. There's no light, there's no sunshine. There's a dark, heavy cloud. And for years and years, that's just how you live your life. It's gloomy, it's depressing, it's miserable. But then suddenly, one day, the cloud disappears and there's glorious sunshine. Well, I wanna tell you, that is what Christ Jesus does for you. He removes that dark, heavy cloud, and the glorious sun of God rises upon you, and, uh, and you begin to experience what it is to be in Christ. Maybe another little illustration. Imagine if you were to be on death row. I recently watched a movie about someone on death row, and I realized, wow, must be a scary place to be. But imagine you're on death row for a severe crime that you've committed and you've been in prison for many years now, just waiting for that fateful day and you are condemned to die. And then somehow, miraculously, the judge out of the blue declares not guilty, let him go free. Imagine that. What would that mean for you? What would that do for you? I suggest that that would be so massive. You would feel like this weight falling off your shoulders. You would feel that tremendous breakthrough. But you know what, folks? Actually, the whole human race is actually on death row. Really. The human race is on death row. And we are justly and rightly condemned because of our rebellion against God. But it doesn't stop there. But because of Christ Jesus, we are declared not guilty. The price is paid in full and we are set free. This is what Romans 8 verse 1 is all about. Now, no condemnation can be understood in two ways. Firstly, there is no condemnation being pronounced on you by God because you are in Christ Jesus. And just a scripture to back that up, it's John 5 verse 24 in the NLT. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, those uh, who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Now listen to what Jesus says, they will never be condemned for their sins. Why don't you just receive that? That's talking about people in Christ. They will never be condemned for their sins, but have already passed from death into life. So the first way you can understand no condemnation is that God is not pronouncing condemnation over you because of Christ. Another way you can understand no condemnation is that there is no need for self-condemnation there's no need to accept condemnation that others try to put on you, and there's no need to accept condemnation from the enemy, especially not. And I wanna say to you that, may I encourage you this morning, don't be somebody that gives in to condemnation. Don't do that. It's not what you're supposed to do. It's not where you belong, under that dark, heavy cloud. And especially, when the enemy comes to try and accuse you and condemn you, you resist him in Jesus' name because you are submitted to God. It's interesting in Revelation 12 verse 10, it says, the accuser of the brethren who accused them. 
before God day and night has been cast down. Sometimes the condemnation, the accusations from the enemy, enemy seem so relentless, but I want to tell you the enemy is defeated, and you need to treat it as that, and you need to realize I'm not going to allow him to lie to me. But folks, have you ever noticed that sometimes even believers, spiritful believers, battle with condemnation? We're not supposed to battle, but somehow we do. And if you struggle with condemnation, then you'll probably experience things like this. You'll have feelings of unworthiness, maybe feelings of shame, awareness of past guilt. If you battle with condemnation, there's awareness of past guilt, awareness maybe of present failures, or feeling that you are not good enough. But I wanna say to you, child of God, Romans 8 verse one is specifically for you, because Paul understood that even some of the believers that he was writing to were battling with this thing. But he needed to know, he needed to tell them that they could be set free, because if you understand the truth that there is no condemnation, then you begin to be set free from that. And so Romans 8 verse 1, I'm saying it again, there is therefore now no condemnation. Say those two words, no condemnation. Say it again, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I also want to tell you, it doesn't matter how you feel, it matters what God has done. You might say, I feel condemned. Well, it doesn't matter how you feel because God has freed you from condemnation. Point number two. I love this one. Walking in the Spirit empowers you to have victory over sin. Let me repeat that. Walking in the Spirit empowers you to have victory over sin. I believe that we don't hear enough messages in the church telling us that we can have victory and power over sin. But when I look at the teachings in the Word of God in the New Testament, all the things that Paul taught, I realize he was teaching this to the church many times. And he was saying, guys, you don't live like that anymore. You now have victory over sin. And let's look at the verse. Romans 8, I hope you've still got it open, verse 2 to 4. It says, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse four, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, those three verses, I, I see two phrases that really stand out for me. The one phrase is this, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. That's a powerful verse, powerful phrase. And the other one that stands out for me is walking in the spirit. I believe that that refers to our part. Now let me say, just level with you for a moment. I have found this whole concept of the law of the life of the Spirit quite difficult to understand at times. For years I would read this and not really understand. Maybe you've read this too and you read this, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and you think, well, what does this really mean? And how do I understand it? And, and why is it called a law, you know? And, and so I'd like to try to explain just in a simple way to perhaps help you. And this is it. There was a law that was in operation. It was called the law of sin and death. You sin, you die. <laughs> That's it. There was that law that was in operation. But now that you are in Christ, there's a new law a more powerful law that is in operation, and it's called, quite simply, the law of the power of the Holy Spirit. In simple words, that's what it means. This is the law of the power of the Holy Spirit, and this law overpowers the old law. The new law trumps the old law, and the new law sets us free from the old law. 
And some people are sadly still trying to live under this old law when God says, no, 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 I have given you a new law. It's the law of the the life-giving power of the Spirit activated in your life. And that is the law that sets you free from the law of sin and death. Now, I'd like to make it even more simpler. And I found um, in the New Living Translation, it puts Romans 8 verse 2 very, very easy, easy, easy to understand. Makes it tremendously plain to understand. Listen to this. Romans 8 verse 2 in the New Living Translation. Quite simply, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that cause for rejoicing? The power of the life-giving spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, has freed you from the power of sin. And so I wanna say to you, the point here, the reality is that you can overcome sin in this life. You can overcome sin. And I wanna say to you, what sin are you maybe battling with this morning? Are you struggling with a particular sin in your life, like a familiar sin that you keep on going back to? Maybe are you struggling with things like anger? Are you struggling with unfaithfulness? Are you struggling with dishonesty in your life? Are you struggling with lust? Are you struggling with hatred? You just have this this thing of hatred in your heart. Are you struggling with jealousy? Are you maybe struggling with stealing? which is a sin, and you go into a shop and you just wanna grab something when nobody's looking and put it in your handbag. Are you struggling with these kinds of things? Well, I want to tell you, hear me very clearly today, and I'm speaking from the Word of God. You are not helpless. You have been given the power to overcome. And I wanna say it this way, the power of the Holy Spirit enables you to overcome the power of temptation. And so simply put, you have power over sin. (laughs) And this is part of the glorious victory that we have in Jesus Christ. And more and more of us as believers needed to take God at his word, need to begin to receive it into our hearts and say, well, thank you, Jesus. I do have power over sin because you, the life-giving spirit, are empowering me. And so the answer to our sin problem as mankind has come through the cross of Christ and it has come through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the scripture is telling us this morning. I was just thinking of a bit of a practical example. I've always enjoyed motorbikes. And since, since I was a little guy, I, I, I was blessed to get a motorbike when I was seven years old. My buddy had actually been given this bike on Christmas Day, tiny little one-gear bike called an Italjet. And he'd been given this on Christmas Day and uh, he drove it in the garden on Christmas Day and rammed into his uncle's BMW, and that was the end of his motorbike pleasure. <laughs> so it got fixed up. Next thing, it was for sale for 300 bucks, and, uh, and my dad said, well, I'll pay half. And I had about 120 rand, and I was gonna loan about 30 rand from him, and then my dad would pay the other half, so I got my first motorbike, and I really enjoyed motorbikes. And, So a little bit later on, I got myself a motocross bike. And uh, especially with motocross bikes, but all bikes in general, they have something called a power band. Now, when you're in a power band on a motorbike, it means your revs and your performance is at a certain level where the surge of the engine's power just begins to, you know? Like you've seen some of those guys doing wheelies on the streets. They are in power band when they are doing that wheelie, trust me. Now, we would be on our farm down in the Eastern Cape, and there was a steep hill that we used to go up. But the thing is, you cannot get up this hill, because it's very steep. My brothers and I, we had cruise up there. You cannot get up this hill unless your bike is kept in that rev, uh, in that rev section where you're in the power band. And so here, Uh, we would get into the power band to get up the hill because if you weren't in the power band, then halfway up the hill, you don't have enough power and they go, oh, 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 oh." and you turn around, you go back down the hill and you try again. And so if we were in the power band, we could overcome the steep hill and we could literally get on top of things. 
And I want to say to you, child of God, the Holy Spirit is like your power band. He does what you cannot do in your own strength. But when the power band comes in, you can overcome and you can be victorious. And so I want to say to you folks that Pentecost is not only about speaking in tongues, it's not only about power to witness, but it is also power to overcome sin. Can I get an amen? The last point, which I said to you is a brief one, cooperate with God by thinking about things that please the Spirit. Let me say that again. Cooperate with God by thinking about things that please the Holy Spirit. And it says, for those who live according to their flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. I wanna tell you that there is something about setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. Because some people wonder why they don't have much victory in their lives. And I would submit to you that I believe it's because they've never truly yielded their minds to God. But you see, God says that he's gonna help you overcome, but you need to be thinking about things that please the Holy Spirit. And so this is the issue. Think about things that please the Holy Spirit. I wanna ask you this. Are you trying to live by your human nature? If you are, you will fail but rather we should be thinking about things that please the Holy Spirit. And so the choice is here between a flesh focus and a spirit focus. But I wanna challenge people today that you need to begin to think in a new focus, the focus of the Spirit. You need to begin to yield your mind to God and you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. 